Um, right, now we can actually get started. And I guess we can start with, we'll start with Jennifer because this is your first novel, right? It like, is, I'm the newbie debut. here. And fantastic <laughs> for debut, by the way. Thank you. Um, but I read that you had been doing some theater writing before, some playwrights and everything like that. I wanted to hear a little bit about that. That's actually what's behind me. I have all these theater posters, but yeah. not as props. It's just where they are. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I've been a playwright for about 20 years. So I'm a debut novelist, but I'm not a, like a new writer necessarily. Yeah. But it's a, definitely a new form. And that's been really interesting to make that transition from the stage to the page. Usually you go the other way, the page to the stage, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's been, it's been really fascinating. It's a, it's a different way to enter a story. So yeah. Yeah. I found that super interesting whenever I read that, especially as someone who kind of dabbled in the theater community before. I don't know if you could tell from the, my everything, but <laughs> um, uh, so I thought that was really cool. And like reading your book, I, totally I it, it doesn't have that feel of like this but you're very in tune with like a way to write emotions both of you are like you're very good at getting the characters emotions across on the page and I know that that's a very theater thing because you have to be able to kind of exaggerate it a little bit to kind yeah, of get it yeah it, it, you have you have different tools and like you don't have interiority in theater yeah right you you can all you have subtext but you also are sort of giving that to the actor and asking them to pick it up and interpret it um i i just found myself writing i would write like a whole scene and then i'd be like oh dear i just wrote an entire scene in dialogue <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask about that later whenever yeah, it's I'm a bit of a habit so i'm i'm crying i go back and add in some you know description <laughs> yes i love that um <laughs> And so I noticed kind of like reading up about you too, and I thought this was kind of funny. So you're from Ontario, you're from Canada, Jennifer, mm -hmm. and now you live in New York. Well, Kachiota, you're originally from Washington, like from, from DC, mm -hmm. and now you're live, you've been all over the world, but now you're currently living in um, Britain or London? Um, Lo yeah, London and, London. and, and yeah. Devon. Um, yeah, you've been all over the world, Katriana, you know, it's like Kenya, Madagascar, Morocco. How's all of that been? You do a lot of traveling and yeah. kind of jealous. Yeah, it, well, the thing is, when you, when you grow up like that, you don't know anything different. So mm. when we first moved away from D.C. when I was three, and we moved back a couple of times and did three year stints there. I think just once, actually. But, um, you know, so you, if you move, so it was D.C. to Kenya, then to Madagascar and then to um back to dc then yemen and morocco and it it it's difficult to take people with you i think yeah. um and particularly when you're that age what happens is because you can't it's particularly in madagascar i remember you know a letter takes six months to get there we didn't i think the phone rang once the four years we lived there um and in our, our school entire school had 12 children in it uh -huh. so it's quite lonely and you become incredibly dependent on your family so we're very close um, but I think also lonely. <laughs> I, I've never, I've never met, I've never met a, a writer who had a really completely well-adjusted uh, social childhood. <laughs> so it yeah, serves yeah. well in the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I kind of noticed that kind of as a theme in you because both of your novels, you know, um, have an overall theme of trauma from whenever you're younger and you know like of course while it's in different ways um and I, I don't want to say too much about the book while because like Jennifer is yours kind of just goes into more like a girl's trauma for whenever she's younger from losing family members and everything like that while Katrina is yours kind of tends to be like on a more abuse leveled one and I just like you know both of your the this the sort of psychological base that both of your books go off of I found that really interesting and I um you know I was able to connect to it a lot um and so going off of that you know no no author kind of has like a fully like you know um normal life um because like then what would you have to write about you know um so I kind of understand and I I just I was able to connect a lot to both of your books is kind of what I was saying with that and that will um kind of will, will what will lead me to my first question is like 
what inspired you to write specifically the horror slash thriller genre? Um, I wanted to like know a little bit about that, maybe if you guys are you know wanting to talk about it. Oh, sure. And we can start with we'll start with Katiana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Well, it's a it's a big question, isn't it? But so I think it probably started. I probably started. Um, uh, my first sort of brush with that kind of fear that you get from from reading and writing the gothic and, and the horror was when it, so we did move around all these all, all for all, all of my life and, to, and until I went to university and then um, but we always came back to one cottage on Dartmoor for uh, for a month in the summer and when I was about thirteen I started having this experience where I would feel a hand in the small of my back pushing me out of bed and I would fall quite hard on the floor um and uh, you know you can tell that there's someone in the room there's you can't hear them or see them or smell them or anything but they're just there I just knew there was someone in the room and they didn't mean me well so for I mean for I think for th five, must be five years every summer for you know for that month we were there I would go and sleep on the floor of my sister's room and we just never told an adult <laughs> neither me nor her and I think that's there's something interesting about that, which is, you know, fear is quite shameful, um, especially when you're that age anyway, and so much is new. Um, you can't tell what's normal and what isn't, because everything is so overwhelming. Um, so that is my mum calling me. Give me a second. <laughs> wow. <laughs> she heard me talking about her. Um, but <laughs> but um, she, yes. So I, I, as far as I was concerned, what this was because it was a very old spooky house what this was was a ghost I didn't have any other explanations for it what it was in fact and what um you know when google came along and when I was able to get a, prof a professional to talk to um what it actually was is something called a hypnagogic hallucination which happens on the cusp of sleeping I think they're quite they're surprisingly common with writers actually I've met a lot of writers and artists who have them um I think um they some some philosopher referred to it as the genius moment and he'd try and catch it. He'd like fall asleep with this sil silver ball in his hand. So when it dropped and made a sound, it would wake him up. He'd catch this genius moment on the cusp between sleep and waking when these sort of phantasmagoria would visit him. But anyway, I found it absolutely terrifying. And it was, the, I, it's the sort of fear you don't replicate in the daylight world. I, I, I think that's the most afraid I've ever felt. And um, when I first read I think it was the monkey's paw by w w jacobs i felt that again it's a hand reaching into you really it's really it's you feel cold inside in a way that you that that no other experience uh causes and i thought well this is what you do this is how you this is the architecture you build for this um for this feeling and i think it's i, I do think it's very profound um you know the gothic and, ho and horror literature i think it's it's asking readers to, and, and authors to do something incredibly vulnerable and, and, and empathetic and relatable. You know, you're asking both people to go very outside their comfort zones and, and you're, you're asking them to take your hand and you're leading them down the dark tunnel. I, th I find it very moving. Um, and I, I think you know, obviously all, all, all writings, empathy and telling people what you think about things. But <laughs> I think there's, it's a bigger, darker room um, horror and suspense in the gothic because you you've got to go to places which aren't very comfortable and are as I said I, I think I think people find them shameful I I, I, st I still get that reflexive feeling of like oh it's not okay to be afraid yeah that's it's so interesting I know because I've, I've totally felt that before I just never kind of knew the name of it um, so that's yeah. that's really interesting and wow that yeah I I I, I totally get that yeah that's actually kind of cool, you know, to like have like to know that so many people have experienced that. And I also love gothic literature. So I, I know exactly what you mean. So that's really interesting. Thank you so much. What about you, Jennifer? <laughs> well, I, I've not had the encounter with a ghost. Um, <laughs> well, nor have I. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, okay, that's true. That's true. We just talked about how it wasn't a ghost. <laughs> right, right. That's true. That's true. I actually have a big a lot of questions about I'm really fascinated by what that is even is and I think I found myself yeah. becoming very fascinated with this question of what is it to be haunted um I, I mean my childhood was was relatively I mean it was it was in it was very rural 
Um, and but it was also very, you know, much more stable than the childhood of the protagonists in my book. Um, but there were a lot of old, very old places that I used to, I, 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 I've written about this, like why I'm interested in abandoned places. And I think part of the reason is that I think that they, I, I feel like they have story just sort of like sitting in them. And um, I, uh, when I was about 13 years old, I learned about this with some friends, um, learned about this haunted, supposedly octagon house in our area. And so of course we're 13. <laughs> what 13 year old can possibly refuse the opportunity to like go into an abandoned house yeah so yeah. we went and uh, I mean we were in there for maybe like five minutes at the most and but it there was something about entering into that space that place um I felt like I was walking into story mm. I guess is the maybe the best way I can describe it is I felt like something happened here I mean Possibly I just carried that expectation in with me because I'd been told that something had happened there. Some yeah. woman had died tragically. And, and so I'm 13 and that's wildly romantic and thrilling. And, um, but when I went to write, I found myself returning to that experience. And this thought, uh, I had this image of sort of four girls the same age, 13, 14 years old, trying to decide if they were going to cross this threshold. Right, because once you've had the experience, once you've crossed the crossed the threshold, you can't undo that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think I, you know, for for me as a child, I, I tend to write characters that have a, a lot of longing in them, and maybe a loneliness, and that uh, could have been. You know, I grew up in the country, you know, spending a lot of time, you know, in my head and reading books and telling myself stories and um, being very comfortable in that space as well. But also there's a there's a sort of I, in the book, I write about this idea of this hollowness. But I think that there's a when there's a hollowness inside somebody, it can create a, like you you look to fill it. And um, sometimes you feel you're drawn to darker things. I don't know. I've always been drawn to really dark stories and I I don't entirely know why I'm I'm a, I'm a, I feel like I'm a really nice you know not dark person but do you think it's a sort of attempt to rationalize like to to make life more to make to make sense out of life in a way that to, to, to try to deprive it of its arbitrariness like you know because these things happen to us without any sense of schematic or plot Absolutely. and and if you order it you know, get you sort of have a sense of getting your conceptual universe in into some sort of comprehensible form so Absolutely. it's not so terrible yeah. yeah and 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 we look for we look for cause right yeah. like if something happens to us we it's very natural right. to, to tr step back and go but where did this start where where what was the what was the turning point that led if i what if i had gone this way instead of that way and, and it's kind of useful if there's a perpetrator as well, because so often there isn't. And I think that's maybe that's where it feeds into true crime as well. Like that's why yeah. true crime is so comforting because there is a villain. You, you, yes. You, bad things happen for a reason. Yes. Um, and we yeah. want that reason. We search yeah. for that reason and stories yeah. sort of give us that reason. And yet I think in real life, um, you know, that. there often aren't those reasons, right? Like these things mm. happen to people and... Um, I think there's also something in this form that offers a, offer, offers a catharsis to people yes. that, you know, I mean, that opportunity to have that larger than life experience. I mean, why do people ride roller coasters? Why do we, why do we seek out the edge? It's like we seek the edge, right? Yeah. In a safe way. <laughs> and I think that this sort of, you know, horror, thrillers, all of this sort of stuff, it allows us to like touch that edge. I wonder if there's a sense of rehearsal about it as well, a sense of preparation. So when it comes, the calamity, you'll be ready. Um, I wonder, I wonder if, I, I, I wonder if maybe there's, because things like true crime, especially are, are notoriously, but women, are, women are very much drawn to that. And I wonder if there's a reason why, perhaps if you feel vulnerable, um, in the way, the same way that they say, don't they, that dreams are sort of almost like the mind rehearsing for various scenarios. <laughs> if they are, it's not a very good rehearsal. But um, <laughs> it's just, it's, I mean, my, yeah. But um, I wonder if, yeah, I wonder if there's a sort of sense of arming yourself 
for that uh, for that day when it comes for you yeah as if I can if I can possibly rehearse every yeah. every single scenario I'll be ready I, you can't yeah. take it by surprise yeah, yeah and I'll know what it feels like yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. have felt that it can't it won't yeah. surprise me yeah yeah, yeah. and and it, it's something it's fascinating right it's so human to to I think want to do that to yeah. and uh, even though if it's doesn't work <laughs> we oh, yeah yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> We don't, we don't stop and and so I, I and everybody I mean obviously everybody has a sort of different edge that they're or a different yeah. you know that they kind of rehearse towards but mm -hmm. I I don't know yeah I've always been really drawn to this sort of like really dark dark minds dark ideas like people who do dark things like not in my real life I don't date yeah. them but yeah. I want to read about them but that's a good boundary to have. Very healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's that, yeah, you don't you don't have to live a sort of dramatic life to be, you know, to be dramatic on the page, do you? And I wonder if also there's that sense of worry, I don't know, exploratory feeling of because those those dark people don't just turn around one day having turned. There's a long road you walk, isn't there? Yes. And maybe you don't know how far along the road you are until you turn around and look at your footsteps. I just, I, I, that's what I find so frightening about that is, is the making of the monster because Me too. many of them don't start out as a monster. Absolutely, yes. Hmm. And, and, and I also feel like there's a, for many of us, there's a sort of line, right? There's a line that we would not cross. But if you do cross yeah. that line, what then happens? it's yeah. like anything yeah. can happen. Yeah. And it's, it's, and that's, I'm so fascinated by what is that line, right? Like yeah. to, and to, and so you get a character that finds themselves at that line and what happens if they just step across? And then, yeah. I mean, it's sort of free fall. Like, and it's, sometimes they can step across it in a moment of, you know, moral dilemma. And sometimes yes. even more terrifying, they can step across it unknowing, just yeah. a gentle slip. And that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's, that's the thing that's, that sort of terrifies me is what if yeah. I'm the monster? <laughs> What well, yeah, and exactly and then that yeah. goes that connects back to that idea of 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 sort of like digging back and going where did this start right like for me I mean yeah it, it, like in in the in my book there's a there's a sort of point where she there's an emotional response that that the that the protagonist has as, as a 13 year old 14 year old right it's an emotional response it's mm. in the moment and yet she now as an adult thinks that everything kind of like dominoes back to that right right so she crossed a line it's actually she learned that she could do that. And that was a very frightening realization um, uh, that happened in the moment. And it was a moment of just pure emotion. Yeah, as you say, that first domino, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost a terrifying question in itself, isn't it? Just what we are and why we are. Like sun, Sundial is all about that nature nurture. Like what are, are we, first of all, you know, what, who are we? I don't think ever anyone has a really, solid grip on that for themselves you know there's always these un a lot of so much of our behavior comes from the these unknown depths beneath the surface and but also you know what oh, is it genetics is it upbringing is it you know or, or is it what happened to us yesterday and that's a, that's a terrifying idea is not to know not not to feel in, we hate not feeling in control and we're not ultimately so these questions just <laughs> Can I ask a, uh, David? Can I uh, can I ask a question? I don't I don't think it'll give anything away. Yeah, but it, you can ask whatever you want. <laughs> so in in Sundial, it's about the the with the click. Mm, yeah, and because that is meant to change behavior and 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 yes, I, I'm so curious about it. And and is it is it real? And is it? I'm just fascinated, right? And this this question of what leads to behavior, how do you get to the point of being there when you start yeah. here, right? I, yeah, I don't think there are any easy answers. And I think, I, think, I think part of the horror of the book is that, again, without, without spoilers, I, d yeah, I don't no, I think don't. the I don't the want to spoil anything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, I have to talk around this book instead of talking about it. But um, <laughs> um, I, I do think that, what it what it really rests on is that horror of those uncertainties mm -hmm. is it real does it work is it even a real thing like or perhaps it perhaps it just does nothing and and i i find i found that kind of 
moving because what you want is an answer you want someone to tell you you know here's to draw the line in the sand and go yes. this is why this happens in this way and this is what you are and, blah, blah, blah. and if you can do this you guarantee the bad thing won't and happen. exactly and that will be yeah there's an outcome predictable it's outcome so yeah but it's not neat because yeah. the, you in in the book again I, I will i will tread carefully there's a it feels like there's this sort of like internal battle that's then starts to happen between um yeah. nature and, yeah. and the sort of scientific addition that's and it's in it's sort of this in this behavioral kind of battle and it's it's yeah. it it's fascinating and it's and it's terrifying <laughs> it is terrifying i mean you know it obviously it's a real the the what happens to the dogs is a real experiment the cia did at Langley is it okay all right yes I see. so yeah which if, when i read about it i thought well i have to write about this i just it was it's it was just so fascinating for so many reasons it epitomizes that sort of that that frontier spirit of that time where the mk ultra experiments it, it was part of the behavior modification program of the mk ultra experiments and it, and it happened at langley virginia where they essentially over the course of two years created remote controlled dogs by implanting electrodes in their brains and um in uh, encouraging them to seek out the pleasure centers which were being stimulated so if they turned left they'd feel you know pleasure and they learned to look for the pleasure stimulus so they do what they were told simple things like turn in a, they could walk in a square and sit and you know go to a certain place not very complicated but you know and a lot i i mean i find i think we i think if you write sort of horror or the darker side of fiction you tend to write the things that horrify you and i find that animal experimentation particularly horrific so, um, and what was particularly horrific for me about this particular one was that after two years, they discontinued it because it had no practical application whatsoever. It was just, it was just making a dog walk in a circle, but with great, you know, quite, quite a lot of cruelty and some grisly um, failures. Um, and I, I just thought, <laughs> I thought how, um, you know, how gratuitous of, of us really, um, just, just, this, um, as, it's a constant point, it's a point of reference for me, Jurassic Park, but that mm. line of, um, you know, you were so busy wondering whether you could, you didn't stop to think whether you should. Um, and it's all declassified now. You can read it on the black vault. These, um, you, got, you can see these very bad quality pictures of some of the dogs and everything in the book, the details of how they did it, the de little dental caps with, um, with dental cement and electrodes implanted in various parts of the brain. Is, is I took that from... I just took that verbatim. There was no imagination there. It's, it's, you know, one's constantly surprised that the world contains far battier and, and more horrible things than one could actually dream up, you know. Yeah, but that's that also was... what, what, that's what makes it so, that's what makes it scary, right? It's, it's right. You, you, you take a little bit of the familiar, yeah. you take a little bit, like the familiar in this case being, well, training a dog, right? Yeah. Training right. a dog, you 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 train a dog through you know through like positive reinforcement. That's I mean I had a dog. That was what I was yeah. taught. And yeah. and then you take it a step further, but it's still sort of grounded in reality. And then yeah. you take it into the and then it goes a little <laughs> further. And then it be, and and when I was you know young and reading like I think I love Stephen King so much right. because I felt like I could recognize the setting. I could recognize yeah. where we were. And then everything turned. <laughs> yes, really that scary. sense of defamiliarization, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. 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 And I'm sorry, dogs... but I think I went over. Oh, sorry, you. we're talking over you. <laughs> no, no, don't worry about it. I love this. I was just <laughs> going to say because that was one of the things that I was going to talk about um, was that both of your books have a level of research to them. Um, like yours with with the dogs, which I had actually heard about that before. So that I was actually kind of familiar with it going mm. into reading yours. And mm. Jennifer, I know that you did a lot of research about comatose because one of the characters of the book is in a coma almost mm -hmm. the whole time. And so that was just what I was going to talk about. And then you guys just went out without me even having to say. So that was awesome. And so, but Jennifer, if you wanted to talk a little bit about your research too, I found that I was going to be super interested in that as well. Yeah, well, I... I... I mean, I and this has actually come from writing writing plays too, where I'm I'm sort of I'm treading into the I've written I had a theater company for a long time, and we would do these plays that were sort of a a, a combination of um, in, interview based material that we would then 
bring in, I, I was usually doing the writing and then I would bring in a fictional story and kind of weave them together. So you're sort of weaving or stitching together the, the real and the not real or the true and the fiction and that sort of thing. And I find with research, it's really interesting. Like I can, there can, sometimes I can um, kind of like what you did, I can read something and it just sort of sparks, mm. right? Um, and, but then I can, I have to be careful that I don't get bogged down in like just research. It, yeah, so it that, can be a trap. <laughs> it can. It's such a, it's such a trap. And so I find, and I found this actually also with like writing about people too, is, is there's a sort of, you have to let your imagination take over. I have to give myself permission to fictionalize. And then I can go back and, and make sure that everything checks out. So I actually, I wrote, um, I wrote the coma stuff, um, basically, you know, out of what seemed to make the most sense, like dramatic sense um, f at the time. And then I kind of double checked it with, I, I, I spoke to a professor who's at uh, Skidmore College, which is a, a liberal arts school where, where I teach as well, and kind of ran it past her. And, and she helped me kind of just make sure I was like checking, you know, doing it correctly. And I hope I have done it correctly. I'm, I do, I mean, any mistakes again are mine, but but and it, but I what the thing that I find really fascinating when you're writing about something that where you're you're taking the real and then you're going off in your imagination. My experience more often than not has been that I'm right. Like I go down this path and I'm like, okay, I may be way off here. And then I ask someone, they're like, oh, actually, no, that's fairly accurate, right? It, it like again, it kind of makes dramatic sense. So. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have to do any, you know, radical changes with with that. And I also did some little bit of research with the uh, dialectical behavior therapy that's in, that's in the book as well. And again, spoke to somebody, but that was based off of like conversations with people who were in that therapy, and and just hearing a little bit about it and going, oh, that's so interesting. This idea of two two root two things that can coexist. And then sort of taking that metaphorically and kind of going off with it and then going back and checking. But it, yeah, research is a delicate balance. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you're really right that in a way, sometimes it's best to do it afterwards. Um, I mean, it, I, I can imagine ways in which that could go very wrong, but... <laughs> well, also, if you've gone way off, it's going to be really frustrating. Yeah, <laughs> but I, just the I, 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 I sort of, what you were saying was, was chiming with my experience I, I think more and more if you can imagine it it could have happened mm -hmm. and and if it could have happened it probably did somewhere um which is handy for us actually it, it horrifying given what we write about but also yeah, handy. <laughs> yeah. good point <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, it's that saying that no thought is an original thought, but in, in, in that way, you can think, well, then everything is kind of original then, you know, because yeah. you can think of something and it's probably happened somewhere, but that, especially given with what you guys write, you know, that goes into the horrifying part of it, you know, um, like especially doing research on true crime and everything like that. It's a very mm -hmm. interesting line to see like kind of what the human mind can think of. And that's what I feel makes psychological horror, you know, such an interesting genre to write in. Um, mm. And so, yeah, that's, it's fascinating hearing you guys talk about this because, you know, I've had a lot of thoughts about this myself and hearing you guys talk about it, I'm like, this is fairly common, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's super interesting. And I mean, um, <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, one of the questions that I had, you guys kind of already talked about where like, you know, the things that you guys have in common is the creepiest parts are very real world. And, you know, um, you guys had already kind of talked about how that is where your interest lies is about, you know, how humans can take that. And so um, that is really interesting as to why you went with kind of the overall horror of it being what the humans can think of and what mm. is actually happening with the people instead of like focusing on the actual supernatural element of the book it's kind of just kind of like thrown in there you know um, I think often the so supernatural can often be a sort of I don't I don't know it seems to be a sort of if you're talking about things like monsters that we've 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 conceived of they they seem to be perhaps uh, a way of um fending off the truth of what human beings are capable of so you just, you just go, oh, well, a vampire did it. 
yeah. then you don't have to deal with the fact that well that people are, are capable of hurting each other to that degree or you know that uh, that such things you know such things exist i don't know i don't know i so i i, I think that the humanity of of horror is what we sort of spend our lives like putting up you know putting our eyes over our, putting our hands over our eyes hiding from yeah, yeah. absolutely um the idea, the idea that, that that couldn't possibly happen and then you find out that again you find you find out that it did and even monsters i mean even if you look at like like the like the genesis of monsters right like yes. the classic monsters right there's there's a, it's, it's actually really fascinating to imagine how I'm teaching a class right now on witches, right? And it's yes. it's it, it, it's very it's fascinating, and to think about this sort of like thing that's become a trope or, or, yeah. or whatever. But to to actually take the steps back and look at like, well, why is this? The, and it, and so much of it is also, I mean, in that case, it's I feel like it's more of somebody who's been made other and victimized yeah. and and made non-human and made monstrous that way. But then there's other other people who again they go so far over that line that they kind of enter into monster maybe maybe willingly but i'm, I'm fascinated by monsters but not in the like uh, kind of yeah 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 the, I, in but, here. so with, with witches so i i i'm particularly interested in you know when because i was reading about the 17th century norwich witch trials you know with matthew hopkins the witch finder mm. general and like what really baffles me is when they do the watching the waiting up to see if you know the devil visits and quite often he does and you know in in the in the uh you know a mole crawls out from under her skirts and starts to suckle her and there is no doubt in my mind that to some degree someone believes they saw that oh yeah and it's extraordinary to me this i i want i it's very difficult to understand with you know our kind of post freudian post jungian minds but like it, i want i just i'm fascinated by by how people construct these you know construct their world their imaginative world around them absolutely and i think one of the, one of the biggest things that's really hard certainly for for me to understand but it's is the is the idea that certain forms of evil uh mm. you know back centuries ago and i think for some people today were very very real like we're yeah. very like 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 the idea i'm actually i'm reading a fantastic book right now that's coming out in december and it's it's mm. about the devil um it's by Luke Dumas by uh, it's called the history of fear it's great it's gonna be great and you're gonna yeah. love it but <laughs> um but it's a, and it's a very much about the devil in Scotland but like this idea like with the witch trials and all that sort of thing the mm. the devil was a real thing it was this was a real thing and so so therefore that that, that kind of makes the fear very different right or you know, you or, or and have, witches were real. They were real yeah. things to many people. You can't, in a way, you can't have the uncanny exist in a pre in in a in a, a society that believes in miracles, because in a society that believes in miracles, there is no there, there isn't that division between what's possible and what isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and a ghost is literally, you know, the existence of ghosts is is is, is acknowledged, and it, so it doesn't have the effect that particular effect of the uncanny that comes that comes with the age of skepticism and the, and the age of enlightenment, and the age of reason. Um, and I, I find that fascinating as well, because it's, of course, so, you know, if you live in a world where miracles are possible under a, a more Catholic belief system, then it's just Barry the ghost and it's, he's just regular and it doesn't. And if you live in an, a skeptical, a completely skeptical place if, with complete knowledge that ghosts don't exist, then that's not frightening either. It's frightening is the, is the might, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it's the, it's the it's the like. Well, why why not? I mean, that could happen. Yeah. Which is I got, comes back to my thing of like, I was not intending to write a book with a ghost in it. That was not right, my right. It, the, the 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 ghost just sort of found its way in, and then I had to grapple with this thing that I have. Like, do I even believe in ghosts? I don't know that I do. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know mean. that I don't. <laughs> But I mean, I whether you it. believe in whether you believe in them or not, there's no doubt Maybe people have been seeing them. They've, people have been seeing them since we've existed. So in a way, it doesn't really matter whether they exist yeah. or not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then again, it's it's this question of where does fear lie? Where is mm. it? Is, is it the, the sort of idea of evil too? Right? Is it this thing that's outside? It's ex, it's exterior. We can enter it. We can see it. Yeah. Or is it is it all generated in here? Is it coming entirely through our perception? 
right? Like you talk about the, the, the little mole coming out from under some yes. skirt and all that sort of thing, right? But, but if, again, if our perception is this person has uh, a malevolent spirit, right? This person is dangerous, mm-hmm. is, you know, I could, you know, I can see, I will see it if I look for it. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the, a be- a there? I don't absolute. know, but it's in yeah. here and I'm, it's through my glasses that I'm seeing it. Exactly. We create these apps. We can create these absolutes. And yeah. Yeah. In a way, we're, we, we are indeed the most terrifying monster. We are. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And going on a little bit about what you said about your book, again, like no spoilers. So I think I'm going to phrase this correctly. I what I felt from reading the book, at least, is the ghost in your book kind of ended up being a way for a lot of the characters to have a common experience. Yes. You know, Look, and so I felt it. like the ghost kind of um, the ghost in the story kind of was able to just tie multiple people together and like, you know, just like in normal life, because Katrina, you talked about how people have been seeing ghosts since, you know, since mm-hmm. forever. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's just a common experience that ties people together. And so that's what I felt that the, the, the ghost really was about, you know, it was able to um, bring Claire and other characters in the story mm-hmm. kind of together to have that sort of bond. Because she does, again, no spoilers, she does end up forming a bond with one of the other characters based right. off of the fact that they have both seen this ghost, you know? Right, yeah. right. And right. so, you know, that's really, because you said you, you the ghost just found its way in there, but maybe, you know, psychologically, like deep in the back of your mind, that's kind of what you were trying to do the whole time. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems no, but like, it's quite possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to just like keep that humanity in there, because that's something that both of your books kind of focus on is humanity but also what happens with humanity kind of along the way whenever you know our brains start to kind of unfurl and you know especially in, especially in Catriona's book kind of goes into like what the human mind can do and like mm-hmm. what humans can think of to do especially with the dogs and everything like that mm-hmm. um so yeah, that's fascinating. And like, I was just gonna ask a couple of craft questions about how you guys write. Um, like, cause especially with Jennifer, you coming from um, a playwright background. So you kind of already talked about this, how you found yourself like writing dialogue. I just was like, is there any patterns that you guys fall into to either give you the motivation to write or whenever you start to write, you know, like whether it's like, you know, writing at the same time of day or just kind of what you find yourself doing whenever you start to write. And we can start with either of you, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> you can start. <laughs> oh, oh, I see, I see. <laughs> um, I pass it to you. <laughs> I think um, my main uh, have my main ritual when 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 writing every day is to desperately convince myself that I'm not going to write that day. So it's more a case of like just sitting down at the table, no big deal. Just going to get out the laptop. Just going to check to it said not writing not going to do writing just going to open the file just opening the file <laughs> it's literally tricking myself into doing it because if I think about the enormity of the task of of writing a novel and also there's a sort of it is very much like going down into you know going in you know into into an underworld for the day you know you have to you, you know you have to enter into your character's experiences and it's not always nice actually um and to do it justice you have to really go there and sometimes you think oh <laughs> I don't want to um but so I think for, for me the to, I, and I always remember that thing about Patricia Highsmith the way she wrote in order to lend it the most relaxation possible so it, it had borne no resemblance to work whatsoever she would write in bed smoking and drinking whiskey and I just thought that's exactly that's exactly right and this is why we drink so much is because <laughs> you can't you just constantly constantly trying to uh, trying to to kind of um, distract your mind from the task at hand because it's just it seems overwhelming but yes I used to uh, so I used to write a lot on trains and on transport because I find that the sensation of moving I, I used to just go to a station the station by my house just get on a train and then come back and then you know just go around on trains all day I found it really good obviously mm-hmm. Covid has put a stop to that particular little habit um, but I think anything you can do to 
to shake your mind loose of its of, of its usual perch is is always really handy because you do a lot of the same thing, don't you? Staring all day at the same screen, at least you know going somewhere and changing the backdrop around behind the screen is is, is useful. So for for me, keeping variety of all kinds helps me focus on the on the on the on the on the on the task at hand. Sometimes I, I I used to sometimes go into like I like I would like going into like really busy places because it kind of creates this wall of busyness. it's private actually it's yeah more private. it is it is yeah. you're kind of you're kind of invisible yeah um but I've I mean I but I've written in all different in all different situations I I I find that I tend to write in bursts um and so. It, but it really depends on where I'm at with a with a piece. Like if it's yeah. rolling, then I can I can write for a really really long time and and just sort of like lose time. If it's not rolling, I'm like right right. Okay, how many words is that? Let's see. Maybe I can stop now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's only been ten minutes, and I yeah. erased everything. Okay, uh, I guess I got to keep going. But I also write by hand. Um, wow, do you? Well, not the whole story. I just bounce right. back and forth. Sometimes right. I find. If I don't know what to write, I think maybe there's something about writing on the keyboard that feels kind of like I'm committing here. And, and it's, right. I, it, whereas in my yeah. notebook, I can, I'll often start with like, but what if, and then just sort of like trail off as I'm, as I'm feeling my way around, which I'm, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in that stage right now. I'm very much sort of feeling yeah. blindly around. And so I'm, I'm coming at it from all different, from all different angles and that sort of thing, trying to find my way, trying to find my way in. And so I have this sort of notebook that I use and it's, um, and will flip back and forth. And then sometimes if I'm getting going on, I can't, I can type a lot faster than I can write. Uh, I will, uh, if something's kind of coming, on the page, the, then I'll switch to my computer and, and sort of like keep going there. But it's it's sort of fragmented and all over the place at first, and then it starts to form, and then we then we go. But it's very messy. <laughs> it's and I take a lot of naps. <laughs> Always such, that's such such a good such good advice. Sleep, but it's, if, it's, it it yeah. is that edge thing that you. I, I mean, the the there's something about in a certain state of kind mm. of dreaminess. Sometimes things can unlock. I mean, sometimes I'm just taking a nap, but <laughs> it's but it's true. Sometimes I of, I often at a particularly difficult stage. Yes. Um, before I go to bed, I put a question to my brain, and mm. I just let my and obviously no. I have no control of what my brain is doing in the night, but I wake up yeah. in the morning and not quite often I have the answer. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. It's an amazing thing. Yeah. You, you have to, sometimes I think the the approach is a sort of a gentler approach really mm. is like letting, yeah. letting it simmer instead of like, I must get my way through this. And then other times it's, you have to sort of just keep yourself at it and stay in the chair and, and keep going. And it's, you know, always figuring out where that is. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found because you've you you've four four books now, and you just finished. Actually, your fifth. Funnily enough, hold on, wait, is it four? No, funnily enough, I just finished my fifth yesterday. You just finished your fifth. I saw that. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Um, I, Do you find that you have a? Is there a rhythm that you follow for the for each book, or has it changed for each one? Well, it's been different for each one because the needs have been different surrounding it. So, um, with my first two, I had was working full time as well, and um it's just a very different process you you find you you know had more time to do it but also uh you know trying to fit in a lot more stuff around it now i think i've uh, because i've i'm very i'm lucky enough to have have a, a home for these books um with night fire in the us and viper in the uk which is amazing there is also i've never written um i've ne this book i sold it i sold a piece of paper a piece of like a paragraph on a Bit of paper that was always sold there was no book I've never done that before and it was absolutely petrifying um <laughs> because you know it's so petrifying when there's nothing anyway there's just nothing you're like uh, this yawn of nothingness the page staring at you but to, to know that 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 you <laughs> that someone's waiting for it um <laughs> and they paid you money for it it sort of makes it much worse but um I I have, I basically discovered, and I can't believe I just was so, sorry, my computer's falling off. Um, I can't believe I didn't know this before, but I just didn't understand the process of drafting. So with my first two, I would, I would, 
I would craft each sentence out of gold. I used to treat it almost like a seance. I'd sit in the dark, just like waiting to be spoken to. And I don't do that anymore. And I realized, I realized I've given myself permission for, for things to be imperfect. And also for, for, you know, for the next, for the next layer to complete, you know, to improve the process as opposed to trying to just make it that beautiful, shining, wrought piece of um, art the first time out. And God, that's helped. I mean, I, I, obviously I knew intellectually that you're supposed to do drafts, but it didn't feel right. It didn't feel like I could do that. I felt like I had to succeed, you know, immediately. But so that's how it's changed really. How about you? I mean, you were talking earlier about moving from Stage to stage to prose. Did you? What was that transition like? Yeah, I mean, there's in some ways there's a similarity with the, with the with you know the initial the initial draft. I mean, you just yeah. please tend to move a little faster than this book did. <laughs> They're shorter, <laughs> there are fewer words, more white yeah. space. <laughs> um, but there's also a stage in plays where you you bring in other people, right? It's a collaborative yes. process. Yes. And that's a really different experience. I mean, yeah. again, it's an experience I'm very used to. The first mm -hmm. time I did it, it was absolutely terrifying and exhilarating, right? Okay. To, to pass around this, this, you know, nascent thing and have people speak yeah. it and, and see it kind of, it's like watching your child take its first few steps. Um, and it falls a lot and that's okay. You, and you go back and you fix it. And so yeah. I'm very used to that kind of, the, you go from this like isolation into this collaborative process. And then you start having other people come in. Um, I mean, there's obviously with, with fiction now, I mean, it's the editor who's coming in and is, and um, I was really hungry for that. I found, mm -hmm. okay, I've been living in this, I've been living in this little world for so long. I have no yeah. idea. If this is good, if this is terrible, I think it's working, but I mean, who am I to judge? I'm so far in, but oh, yeah. So, but, but um, this book was written over such a long period of time. How long? With, like 10 years. Yeah. Because yeah, I, yeah. it, it was born in NaNoWriMo. Do you know NaNoWriMo? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it was the first 60,000 words, probably 40 of which have been thrown out, but you know, it was born in NaNoWriMo. And then mm. I, I, it was sort of for many years, it was a project that I would pick up and then a play would come up like a play project, a commission or something like that would come up. So I'd put it down again and I'd go off. And then a year later, I'd come back and I'd pick it up again. And that was interesting kind of re-entering it over and over because right. I felt like, okay, well, it's still holding, there's still something here. It's still holding me. So that's good. Um, but it kind of does a different thing with your experience of the story because you have to tell yourself the story yes. again yes. over and over as opposed to it being more of a like I'm living in this story and then I'm going to get it out which so I hope the next book is more I, I think it will be my first one took seven so I can relate oh, okay yeah so I can relate and then the second one took took two and a half and then after that they've been a solid pretty much around Here. a year a piece yeah wow. um it you do get quicker and but I, I had a, I had a teacher who used to tell us about when he, when he wrote his first novel what he used to do because he was he took I think he took a long time as well so he had the typescript beside him every morning and every morning he would type out again from the beginning of the novel everything he'd written so far so sometimes he wouldn't even start writing until the evening by the time he got to the end of the book because he had to write the entire to bed himself back into the narrative wow and I just thought and I said did you do that with the next one and he was like no no, <laughs> I had a computer and I just, yeah, exactly. I saved. that's what the save book. I, well, I've heard that Tennessee, that Tennessee Williams, uh, there's like 40 different versions of, of Streetcar Named Desire or something because it was on a typewriter. Right. And so right. he would literally just retype it and yeah. would make little changes each time. And, wow. and I, I can see something kind of beneficial about that, but I can also, I also feel like it's a tremendous amount of time that um, I would not want to be <laughs> I think it's slightly easier with a play, as you were saying, than with a novel yeah, at as least well. A play is, is, at least a play is, <laughs> is shorter. You actually can yeah. kind of You memorize. could conceivably get something new written that day. But you can, just, yes, yeah. yes, you, you, you can. And I think that was, for me, that was the other big change and was figuring out just literally how to handle this document on my right. computer it was so like I was like oh where's that thing and then I'd scroll 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 where in a play is just literally it's less words it's shorter it's fewer pages it's the magic of learning the, that trick which every writer knows of control searching 
each whatever magical word will take you to that section of the document you're like if I do popsicle it'll take me there <laughs> um, where did I say popsicle <laughs> that's true just, yeah. I, I, I learn I just yeah I, I I rely on that probably far more heavily than I should I I think though I I, I find that there's also something there's a different ways of sort of learning a story. And one thing that I, I had, I, it, it became a, ne a necessity to do in mm. just in terms of controlling this thing, but also was very helpful was like just using, I mean, old fashioned sort of index cards just to help me sort of, you know, there's, there's different storylines. And so to, mm. to kind of ar architect Mm. The lines and when we're you know when's the last time we were there okay we need to come back and yeah I needed I found that I needed a way to be able to see right the whole thing and and I couldn't do that on my computer on a yeah. Microsoft Word document that was 400 pages long I just <laughs> and even I mean I, I, I initially I just had them all in separate chapters and then I put them all together which was exhilarating and terrifying and but yeah. but I needed I needed to be able to see the shape of the story, and yeah. and so that so to be able to think about it to be I had to kind of have that ability to step back out and look at it and then mm -hmm. go back in because I couldn't just stay up close and inside the whole time because I got I'd get lost and maybe part of that was also having lived in it for so long. It very much starts to resemble a landscape, actually, in all of the ways we relate to it. You, you've got to find a high point to look down on it to see where you yes. are. Um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 very much it's very much got a, fi a physical a sense of physicality about it. God, yeah, um, I, yeah, I can't do that. I I, I can't. I I tried doing that with like you know diagrams and graphs. I just can't do it. The only way it works for me is if I hold it all in my head like a sort of palace made of spiders webs and very breakable things <laughs> and every time you change anything the whole thing breaks and you have to build it again well, well this is the other thing somebody will like this is just a small change but what if I'm like <laughs> there is no such thing as this like i mean okay like maybe there's a small change change if she's wearing blue pants and they become green but most things that are small changes if a thing is well constructed if you know mm. well crafted it reverberates through it does yeah. it should and, yeah. and so right. you have to be in control of that. You have to know like, oh, no, 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 no. If we make this little change over here, it's going to yeah. echo over in chapter 36 or something like that, which is, it, it's, I love, I mean, I always, I think the metaphor I prefer, I, I, or I use the most is weaving. I just feel like it's all mm -hmm. about like, threads crossing and, um, and, and, you know, the, the tighter woven the story is, the stronger it is, but, but first you have to figure out what all those threads are and then how they cross it's yeah it's it's I don't know why we do it really um but <laughs> um I was just also love what you were saying earlier about um you know obviously you hand over your work in, when you're working in theatre to actors and directors presumably and but also to the audience and I think there is this sort of same sense with a book I love the idea of, of the reader finishing the book like there is, it, the book exists only in the act of reading. It doesn't exist as, if the, phys, the physical object doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, um, it's in here. Yes, exactly. And yeah, you, yeah and you've, you've somehow, it's the closest we can come to knowing what it's like inside someone else's consciousness. Absolutely. It's the only way we can do it. It's kind of miraculous, really. Yeah, I mean, the, the, with a play, you often just, uh, the, you know, it, it, it tends to get, compared to you, you call it like a blueprint or right. you call it a recipe right like mm, mm, it's mm. not the cake it's how to make the cake it's not the house right. you can't live in the thing yeah. on the page it's just how to make the house and mm. and it doesn't actually take on life until it's in alive in time and space and with an audience because it's, mm. and it's yeah. rehearsed and but but it's it's so true with a novel true right like otherwise it's just a bunch of words on a piece of paper and who cares just the same way you never see the same play twice. You'll never you'll never read the same book twice. Yep, it's always exactly. it's always new for you as well. Yeah, which is I think so wonderful, right? That you because right. you come you come at it, you you come at it differently. It's it's inter I mean, I used to stand at the back of the, you know, at the back of the theater and sort of nervously chew my program and watch the audience instead of watching the play. And so Ooh. now I'm like, you know, watching responses on social media. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> <laughs> a little different <laughs> but it, you know but kind of different and kind of and kind of not right to to yeah. 
in that case, you're actually in this, you're actually in the room where, while people are hearing your story. And so mm, you're, mm. there's always a moment when everybody kind of like shuffles their program or <clears throat> coughs, right? There's a sort of rhythm to a, to a group experience. Yes. And it's very different with a book, right? Like people can pick it up and put it down anytime they like, yeah. you know, they come at it. So in some ways you also have less control over how people consume your story. Yeah, and they, and it's 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 a it happens privately and in, 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 it's an interior experience for the reader. And people can talk about their reading as they as they go along in book groups and so on. But actually, the actual act of it doesn't ha- happens very privately. Yeah. So you can't witness it. Yeah. But I think I think like I think the the scariest monsters are the ones in our heads, right? And, yes. and the most beautiful people are the ones yeah. in our. I always think of um, so when Romeo and Juliet. Mm. Uh, I always feel badly for the actress who plays Juliet right. because Juliet gets talked about a whole lot yes. before she comes on stage. And the way she's talked about is just as the most <laughs> beautiful and then some real human being has to walk yes. on stage. Yeah. And there's no way that she can ever actually be as larger than life as she has been made in the text. That's yeah, and maybe that's part of the effect, isn't it? Is yeah, is I mean, we but we also suddenly see her, her. We perceive yeah. her with all of that too. But then it's just, so it's kind of the same with like scary creatures or monsters or haunted places. And it, again, I right? always find it interesting that difference also between watching horror and reading horror. Yeah, because there's almost like if the audio, the audio, if you're watching horror, you're kind of being presented with a fait accompli. But if you're creating by the interaction with with the text you're creating the horror there's almost more of an element of consent about it in a weird way you're sort of participating in the experience and you sort and you kind of control it control it to a degree or at least it comes from you I I, like I suppose it's just a very long-winded way of me saying I, I I can't really watch some horror Whereas I can read it much more easily. I can't and write I, horror at all. I'm a big uh, scare. It's, dif- it's difficult. It's difficult. And yet we write what we write, you know. I love reading it. I love well, reading it. And I find myself writing it. But I, I can't watch really scary it's, movies. It's just viscerally different, isn't it? The, the reading it and is. the watching. Yeah. But it's so interesting what you say about control too, right? Because with yeah. the book, I have... I feel like I have some form of control. I can put it down. I can stop mm. it. Yeah. I can flip ahead. <laughs> Yeah, and also it's only, yeah, it's, it's only existing because you're 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 contributing to it in, in imaginatively. Yeah, in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas on on screen, I can't. No, you can't. No. <laughs> I'm I'm the biggest. I'm just the big. Again, like, I like, I would never go into a haunted house again. Like I'm I'm just the biggest chicken in the world. Yeah. I mean, write about it. People are people tell me, oh, your book is so scary. Your book is so scary. I'm like. You have to understand. I am more frightened of anything. Than oh, than that's how it's I wrote. That's a common misconception: is that people who write horror are not are not frightened. We are the most frightened. That's why we write it, exactly. and that's why. Yeah, that's, <laughs> my imagination is far too active. <laughs> yeah, because you've got to make. Also, if if you don't, if you're not scared of it, people aren't going to share your fear if it's not there. So. The more scared someone else is reading it, the more scared you were writing it. That's a general good rule, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, it's it's like it's not, it was it, it was fun to write because it was sort of like the same experience as being around a campfire, and I'm right. A ghost story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, I have the control. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. I was, I'm actually that kind of um that special case where I love consuming anything horror media so I actually love horror movies and I love reading horror but the thing is whenever people look at me unless I'm wearing like my dark clothes or anything like that um they're like you read like you like horror movies because whenever you see me I'm like hello you know like I don't act like it at all but I totally get what you mean especially because whenever I was younger I like dabbled in writing you know like any middle schooler does just to get their thoughts out but I wrote horror because I was afraid of the things that were going on in my brain and so I just needed to get that out so it's fascinating that you guys say that you know (laughs) because it really is true (laughs) Because like We're just still doing I, haven't, it. <laughs> I haven't been able to meet many authors, but like many horror authors, but I've, you know, I've seen interviews and like anybody who kind of writes horror, 
Tien, tends to be like the nicest person like junji ito is a very he's a japanese manga artist so like japanese comic books but he mm. draws and writes specifically horror but if you watch interviews with him he is the nicest sweetest man in the world you know and they're like but you write the things that you write and it's just like it's that thing you know you got to get the things out you know you just got to get them this out. came out of your head i'm like yes <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> well, I've had such a wonderful time. We are getting to the end of our time. Is there anything in closing that you guys want to say? Maybe talk about what's coming next. Katriana, you did just finish your book. If you oh want to God, talk yeah. about that a little bit, and Jennifer, if anything that's going next, and I see that somebody said the horror community is the best community, and that is absolutely that true. Is true. <laughs> exactly. The colder the tail, the warmer the heart. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> It's true. Um, I, oh, yeah. So I just, I've, I've still got it behind my eyes, actually. You can probably see it because I just put it down yesterday, just finished it. Um, it's called Looking Glass Sound, and it's about a writer, failed writer, who retires to a cottage on the New England coast to write this great revenge novel about his friend, who was former friend who betrayed him and later became the great novelist he'd always longed to be but didn't and who has now just died so he's now free to to write this this great uh, lacerating indictment of him and um as he writes events in the novel start to take sort of resonate eerily with events outside the novel in his life and he starts finding notes in the cottage from written in the characteristic green ink of his dead nemesis and the question is whether how gone is the nemesis and 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 where and to what extent maybe he's not quite as as dead as, as he might as one might think um, <laughs> and that's out fall 20 uh, no what am i talking about it's out um march 2023 uh anywhere, everywhere well uh, it will be uh, unless it's absolutely terrible and they send it back which is always possible <laughs> well, I'm excited to read it. It sounds awesome. <laughs> what about you, Jennifer? I'm I'm working on another I'm working on another book right now, um, and it is uh, loosely based. It's inspired by an actual uh, event that happened back in the 1980s. Um, and I actually had written a play. It's something that I sort of stumbled on in a newspaper, um, and I wrote a play about it. And and it's the characters have sort of stayed with me and there's a lot more to it that I want to explore so so this is I mean I'm not rewriting the play but it's it's still it circles around this same mm. event and it kind of goes back to this idea of this bad thing happens right this horrible thing happens and we want to trace it back we want to walk backwards and find where was the moment where I made the wrong decision and ended mm. up here um so so it, it's it's very much about uh, uh, about that i'm really in i find myself writing a, a lot of i'm interested in violence but not in the actual act of violence more in the sort of long-standing ripples mm. that come mm. out outward so it's it's very much these sort of like there was this event that happened and it is that's the thing that actually really did happen in the 80s um but then ripples outwards with this, always mm. this question of why why did this random thing happen to these people? This bad thing happened. How, what did they do wrong? Um, so there's a you know there's a monster in this book, but he's not he's not the kind of like horns and mm. scaly. He's a he's a human. Um, but yeah, so I'm 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 working on that. So. That is so exciting. <laughs> taking a lot I of naps. Wait. I'm napping. Yeah, taking a lot of naps. I'm napping on that. <laughs> Well, ladies, it has been so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining me. And like, this has honestly been really fascinating. I've just been sitting here the whole time being like, oh, like, yes, continue. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I can't wait to see what you guys do in the future. I can't wait to read your upcoming books. Hopefully, Jennifer, it'll take less than 10 years. <laughs> it will. It will take less than 10. It will definitely yeah. take less than less than 10. And and um, I'm going to pre-order yours as soon as I, as soon as I am able to. Um, I forgot to, to say that I got one out. Like, one came out last week. Sundial yeah. came out. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> why, am I, why am I promoting the wrong book? <laughs> Because well, I was going to promote you guys' books at the end of this anyways. For anybody who's watching that hasn't read Beneath the Stairs or Sundial, 
you really should because they're great books you know so again ladies thank you so much i hope so i much. hope Kedrani, you have a wonderful night hopefully you'll go yes. to bed soon Sleep well. wind down try and wind my brain down now it's gonna take hours yeah. it's been too interesting that's the problem <laughs> and then jennifer i hope that you have a great evening as well well i'm going to have dinner so i have yeah, a ways to go before <laughs> delicious i hope that it's i hope that it's a good dinner you deserve it <laughs> all right ladies thank you it's so lovely much to meet you. Yeah, yeah lovely to meet you both. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.